Hi, I'm Ann Carpenter, and I'm so pleased to be here today to tell you about the research going on, not just in my lab, but with a lot of different collaborators in a lot of uh, different domains of biology. And I know we have an audience here with a really diverse background, so I'm excited to share um, information that I hope you will find interesting, but I also hope that each and every one of you can find something really useful and practical to come from this talk. The slides are available online, as you can see on, on the, um, the address here, and I'm happy to receive feedback on the talk as well. So let's get started. I first want to give you a, a tale of two industries. In the computing industry, we have Moore's Law, where compute gets cheaper and cheaper over time. And it's really a dramatic testament to human ingenuity that we've been able to maintain this amazing reduction in the cost of computing. Um, and you can see the log scale that's here. It's really just so impressive. What's considerably more depressing is a room's law. It's Moore's Law spelled backward in the pharma industry. And this is a law that describes the fact that discovering new medicines gets more and more expensive over time. And so despite all the amazing advancements that have been made in biology and our understanding of the genome and of um, human physiology, nevertheless, this cost is getting more and more extreme over time uh, to the point where if you had a billion dollars uh, 50, 70 years ago, you could get 30 new drugs on the market, and that same amount of money barely gets you one new drug, and that's only because we've sort of recently come a little bit out of the slump. Um, nevertheless, I think we can agree that it's incredibly expensive to make new medicines, and we have to figure out how to improve this situation, partly because we've got a lot of diseases already that need curing, but on top of that, we've got um, every day discovering new ones, more rare ones that are due to different genetic defects and so on. So let's figure out how we can solve this problem together. So it might help to understand, especially for those of you with less of a background um, on, this, on this topic, that drug discovery, if in theory, you want to find some chemical that you can give to a human with a particular disorder and create a healthy human, right? And so we only know if a compound really works if we can test it in humans, but we can't test it in humans. So what do we do instead? Well, one option is to take millions of chemicals. Most pharma companies have millions, even, even academic screening facilities often have hundreds of thousands of chemicals. And we can take those chemicals and test them one by one, not on humans, but on cells that mimic the disease in some way. And if we take cells that have, have a disorder in some kind of fashion, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect representation of a human or a whole organism or even a whole organ. But if we can look at the how those chemicals are interacting with those cells, we might be able to find compounds that produce uh, healthy cells. And so this system is called an assay. It's a system where we want to check and see whether these compounds are effective. And one example is, is shown here. We have cells that are infected with tuberculosis bacteria. And our goal is to identify compounds that can cause the unhealthy cells to look healthy again. Um, not just that the tuberculosis is gone and killed. That's maybe the easy part. The important part is to make sure that the mammalian cells are still alive and healthy. And so we call this the readout of the assay. The, it, we're looking for a phenotype. We're looking for the cells to respond in a certain way to an assay. And so this is not the, necessarily the mainstream in the pharma industry today. Many, many researchers are using more biochemical techniques to try to find chemicals that um, interact with proteins that are thought to be involved in a certain disorder. But this is a type of screening called phenotypic screening. So we can access a lot of different complex model systems um, th that can be quantified by imaging. It's not just cells in a dish, as I just showed you. You can take some of the same approaches that I am going to be describing today and apply them to all kinds of different sorts of biology, from looking at colonies of yeast growing to um, neurons, co-cultures of two different types of cells growing together. You can look at tissues. We can look at um, whole organisms, and then we can even introduce the multidimensional imaging, by which I mean either time lapse over time or three dimensional imaging. And in each of these different kinds of experiments, the goal is to extract features from the images. So we take the first step is sample preparation. You put the cells or the organisms or something into some kind of um, assay vessel, some kind of dish or, or well that can carry out the experiment. They're basically like a lot of little test tubes all lined up that allow you to do large scale experiments. You then um, allow, allow the cells to grow, treat them with the compounds or whatever it is that you're testing, and then carry out the microscopy. 
And most of what I'm going to talk about today is very standard fluorescence microscopy, not particularly high resolution, um, not usually not particularly high dimensional either in terms of the um, time lapse or 3D, but just static 2D images is, is typically what we are, are dealing with in the experiments I'll show you today. And then the next step is computational. And my lab is entirely focused on the, the computational aspects of, of these kinds of experiments. And what we call this step is segmentation. That's the image analysis that you do to identify, to segment which parts of the image are of interest that you want to measure and which parts are background and, and uninteresting. And so we use this open source software called Cell Profiler that was um, created uh, by, by my lab back in the old days. And once you have carried out the segmentation and image analysis, you're left with lots and lots of features. Of course, you can measure just one thing in an image if that's what you care about, but there's so many things that can be uh, captured in image-based data. It's a real shame to leave the rest of it behind. So this includes things like counting how many objects are there, measuring their shape, their size, their intensities and their textures um, and, and relationships that different cells have to each other growing in the dish. So in the end, we can get thousands of features for every individual cell. And this lets us screen all the things. So the next few slides, I'm not going to describe particular biology or experiment. I know we have such a variety of backgrounds here, but I think anyone can appreciate that there's a lot of different sorts of things that we're measuring here, um, not just different organisms. So we have C. elegans on the, on the left and right. We have individual cells growing on the right and but uh, in the middle, but, um, but also we're just measuring different kinds of phenotypes. So in this one, we're, we're looking at, does this green stuff ex extend from the tail of the worm throughout the whole body? So in each case on the top and bottom, I'm showing sort of negative and positive controls for the different phenotypes that we were looking for. This is a very high resolution assay. We were looking for spots of DNA damage and so on. So I won't go through each of these individually, but I hope you get a visual impression of the different sorts of things we can measure, the colors and shapes and intensities, localizations, and so on, all in different kinds of biological systems that, uh, that our collaborators have painstakingly created. And here's some examples of the multidimensional types of imagery. Um, Time-lapse, these are yeast growing in a in a microfluidic chamber and the Allen Institute for Cell Science is excelling at collecting beautiful three-dimensional data to look at protein localization and variation across cell populations and so on. This kind of, um, these kinds of screens yield, have yielded some success in clinical trials. And um, I think it's really exciting to see that image-based outputs are becoming more and more common in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm just showing a couple that we personally, um, I'm just showing one that we personally were involved in that's for myelofibrosis. John Crispino's lab at Northwestern at the time devised a system looking for um, causing these cancer cells to become polyploid and therefore um, not proliferative and that this uh, was really exciting to show a, a successful clinical trial that allowed these cancer patients longer lifespan. And the same for a project on the right that we had nothing to do with. This is an experiment where researchers took our uh, software cell profiler and used it in a, a personalized medicine um, experiment that was um, a clinical trial that was really exciting because they took tumors from a patient and grew them in a dish and then assessed which compound would be the best to give to that particular patient. And they were able to identify uh, compounds for each person that would be more likely to uh, cure their tumor and, and um, or cause them to go into remission. And that was also a successful trial that, that concluded a few years back. So what's next for extracting data from images? Um, we're pretty excited about bringing deep learning to biology and to bioimage analysis. So your, your phone knows all the members of your family and it can identify them and you don't have to tell it which camera did you use, which lens did you use, what color scheme is present and so on. It just knows. And um, these days barely takes any training whatsoever. Um, in the same way, we would like for microscopes to become that level of smart. And of course, you know, scientific microscopy is a much smaller niche than commercial uh, consumer um, applications, but we nevertheless think it should be possible for anyone to snap a picture on a microscope a few years from now and have it immediately tell you this this is how many cells are in your image and this is the cell cycle distribution we, we can measure the dna content and look at how many are um, before and after dna replication maybe even fancier phenotypes like the malaria life cycle that's shown here even experts have a hard time agreeing on exactly the um 
exactly the the different phases and and which which cells go in which uh, which category but we're hoping that over time with the crowdsourced kind of training that we can get from the community that we'll be able to develop these deep learning based models that are able to detect and then measure different kinds of biological structures of interest it seems like this has really taken um, uh, taken root and in particular we have uh, launched a center for open bioimage analysis funded by the NIH between the image day team at Wisconsin and the cell profiler team um, at the Broad Institute. And those two together are working to create this next generation of, of deep learning tools and also to catalyze the community and help out with uh, tools that other people are making um, in order to disseminate them and make them more user friendly. So really excited. It's a, a really exciting time to be in bioimage analysis because there's so many great um, capabilities coming out and soon I will hope there will be more user friendly tools. In fact, if you're interested in user friendly tools, we just wrote a review article that's uh, cited down here in molecular biology of the cell, where we overview what's out there right now and what what's usable and what you'll find is that um, like like many things there's not one recommendation that's um, you know here's the best tool to use for everything. In fact, uh, it'll be helpful to look at the article in order to understand what kinds of tools are useful in what circumstances. So as a, as a educational aspect of this talk, I wanted to make sure um, everyone's on the right page of what is deep learning. Um, so machine learning in general is where you build an algorithm, you program the computer to have a set of rules that can predict outcomes given examples to learn from. And so deep learning is a type of machine learning that is a, a subset of machine learning where you use many layers of processing and that's what makes it deep. So you give the the computer an example of a cat picture and you say this, whatever you do to this in your innards, you know, this is all very, very murky and not something that a human can necessarily absorb how it's making decisions. But the point is, if I put a cat in, I want you to, to tell me the word cat out. And if I put a dog in, I want you to, to output the word dog. And as I give you more and more examples, inside the guts of it, it's just tweaking all these parameters. Like, okay, did I get the right answer? Oh, if not, then I'm gonna bump a few things up and a few other things down and see if I get the right answer. And as it's making these tiny adjustments across all these different layers in the neural network, it's coming up with uh, eventually correct outputs. And that's how the basic system works so that when you put in an unknown image at the front, it'll give you the correct output at the back. So that's a basic concept behind deep learning. And um, that's what these tools are, are taking advantage of. So for the last part of the talk, I want to transition from measuring known phenotypes to profiling, what we call image-based profiling. Some of you may be familiar with transcriptional profiling, and if so, these concepts are gonna sound very familiar. Um, for others, um, I hope you'll, you'll uh, stick along for the ride because it's although it's very exciting that these days it's basically the case that we can generally measure what we want out of images that's we couldn't say the same thing 20 years ago um so it's very exciting that we can measure what we want to measure but now we're going to turn to measure all the things in images and use the patterns of the data to make biological discoveries so what do i mean by that sounds maybe a little confusing so Image-based profiling is where we use images to create signatures of the sample, whatever the sample is. It might be a gene perturbation, a compound perturbation, it might be patient samples with a disease. So if I have my perturbations, um, as shown here, I can image the cells by staining them in some way. We happen to use this cell painting assay that uses six dyes. And um, it's very similar, actually, if, uh, to think about this concept. It's very similar to the, the old classic genetic um, perturbations that were done on fruit fly eyes. So these are eyeballs from fruit flies. And um, in, the old, in the old days with classical genetic screens, the idea was let's mutagenize a bunch of fruit flies, look at their eyeballs. And if eyeballs look kind of the same in, in some mutant way, then that tells us that whatever gene we, we have perturbed is probably in the same processor pathway as, um, as the others. And so that's the same concept that we're doing here, but we're just scaling it up quite a bit because we're measuring a lot of visual phenotypes. We're not just judging by eye whether the cells look funny or not. And secondly, because of everything is automated, we can do this for hundreds of thousands of perturbations at a time. So we carry out the image analysis, we extract all these features. It's multidimensional because we have 
thousands of features and it's also multi-dimensional because we have thousands of cells so we have this beautiful rich data and you can see this is you know an example of real data you can see okay i can tell maybe i can't tell by eye that these look particularly different from each other but certainly the measurements are telling me telling me that there are differences among these perturbations and if i do thousands of these perturbations then i can start to make maps where i measure the similarity do these two perturbations look alike and do those per two perturbations look alike so what can we do with this power? This is just the general concept of profiling. I can extract a lot of features from biological samples, and then I can look at their, their similarities and differences. So what can I do with it? All kinds of things. And I will spare you, I won't tell you the a dozen different applications today. I'll just focus on a few. But one example is that we can cluster genes based on their morphological similarity. So in this experiment and, and others we've done subsequently, we overexpress genes. We image them using these, this cell painting assay where we just measure um, a label a bunch of organelles within the cell. We carry out the image analysis and we cluster the profiles and we get a beautiful map like this. So whereas this kind of a map, like if I just said, please tell me the relationship between these 200 genes, in, in the old days, biologists would have to go off and spend a few decades studying each gene, try to figure out who interacts with whom and um, what pathways are involved. But in this one experiment, we're able to recapitulate a lot of what biologists have painstakingly put together over many years. So, for example, we see um, KRAS, RAF, BRAF are all up here in this location, um, the HIPPO pathway is uh, shown down in this corner. And basically genes that, that work in the same pathways tend to look alike when you, in this case, overexpress them. And you can imagine doing the same thing by, by CRISPR knockdown. So this is a very exciting initial kind of result that made us really enthusiastic about the concept of image-based profiling. And we've since taken it in all kinds of different directions. I'll just show you a couple today, but one of the ones that I think is most um, easy to understand, but also really exciting is, can we identify signatures of disease? So um, if we can find an image-based indicator of cells having a particular disease, then we can screen drugs to reverse the signature. So what are, what's an example of this? So let's say we take some healthy cells. This is a collaboration with Miko Taipal and Jessica Lacoste at the University of Toronto, where they have uh, labeled with a tag a particular protein that's shown here. This is what it normally looks like in healthy cells. However, if you take that same protein and you make a mutation that is known to cause Noonan syndrome in humans, the localization of the protein looks very different. So this is an exciting result. We found a pathogenic phenotype. We didn't have to know anything about the protein's normal function. We didn't have to study the pathway for a decade. All we have to do is make the mutation that we know has biological significance because it causes a disorder and just look at its location. So boom, we have identified a pathogenic phenotype. Now what we can do is we can take cells in the disease state and we can systematically test drugs one by one to reverse the phenotype. So the image analysis that happens here in step one is just, do we see a difference? Here, it's very obvious by eye, but in other cases, it might be more um, subtle and might require image analysis and machine learning to even see the difference in the first place. But no matter how subtle it is, if it's statistically detectable, then we can test drugs to, to reverse these kinds of um, phenotypes. So in this particular project, they haven't just done this for one particular protein and one particular disorder, they've actually tagged and overexpressed and imaged thousands of disease variants in parallel. Again, they don't have to know anything about these disorders or these proteins or these pathways, just make the wild type version and the mutant version and look for a difference. It doesn't work all the time, as you can imagine. Um, so far, out of the thousands that they've tested, they found a couple hundred disease phenotypes, um, but still, Couple hundred is really, really exciting because now we can turn to step two and find drugs that can reverse this phenotype. So image-based profiling can do so many other things and, and the examples are um, shown here. We can cluster not just the genes that I showed you, but also the compounds by their mechanism of action. We can cluster different alleles. So when you have one gene with lots of different mutations that are found in the human population, you can cluster them to figure out which ones are meaningful. I just want to leave you with this slide. Again, you can download a PDF of the slides to get the different references and look at all the different kinds of um, uh, applications that can be done here. I've also listed some review articles that might help you learn more about this field and some conferences that also are occurring. So thank you very much for your attention and I really look forward to interactive questions.